Well, welcome everybody to uh, Mental Health Issues in Coaching as part of Open Door Coaching's International Coach Week Conference this week. It's uh, one of the last sessions for the week and I'm really looking forward to sharing this information with you. It's a, it's a great session. We ran this session yesterday with another group of people and the feedback was fantastic. So I'm really keen to share this with you and excited to share this with you. It's a little passion area of mine. Uh, and I think particularly at the moment with everything going on globally, um, very topical, very topical. Hello to everyone that's joining us from all over the world. We have Vancouver, Canada, New Zealand, um, lots of people around Australia here as well. Welcome everybody, it's really great to have you. Super, super exciting to have you actually. Vancouver, it's a full moon. Okay, there you go. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's, oh, South Africa, welcome. Excellent, it's been so good this week to see everybody joining us from everywhere around the world. Exciting community of coaches. New Zealand from North Plant, great. I could read that out all day. So um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the, the, sorry, the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities that might be with us today. The other acknowledgement that I'd like to do here, and it's, it's quite unique to mental health first aid, is an acknowledgement of lived experience. And the lived experience that I'm referring to is the lived experience of mental health issues. And there's two aspects to this. There is the lived experience of people who have lived or do live with mental illness uh, or mental health problems more generally, and also the people that care and love for those people. So a really um, important acknowledgement, I think, to make in this particular content, because as we'll see very shortly, some of the statistics um, in, in mental health in Australia, at least, uh, tell us that a good proportion, a good percentage of the people on the line today may well fit into this category. So I'd like to acknowledge um, all lived experience, whether it's personal or through a loved one. Bit of housekeeping to get started with. Uh, what we're going to cover today, a little bit of a bit of an overview. We're going to have a look at mental health uh, as it exists as a continuum. You know, it's a it's a continuum of mental health. We'll look at some facts and statistics around mental health as well. We're going to take a look at two of the most uh, common. Pop I was going to say popular, that's the wrong word. Two of the most common mental health conditions in Australia. Um, we'll have a look at those in some depth. I'm going to have a look at what the cost is of not addressing mental health issues. I'm going to show you a mental health action plan, a, a model for having a conversation with somebody about their mental health. Um, we love a model, we're coaches, we love a model. And in that little section at the end, we're going to have a look at myths and misunderstandings around mental health. And lastly, we're going to ask some big questions to round out Coach Week 2020. And that is, can we coach somebody who has a mental illness? And we'll have a conversation about that. And I'll encourage you to um, share your views through the chat box as we go through the session today. But also, if you would like to come off mute uh, and contribute uh, by via voice, it can often be easier to articulate your questions in this space uh, verbally. We can also do that. So um, let me know if that's the case. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that, you know, there is plenty of time for questions, but as well that a lot of the content that we'll cover today comes from the mental health first aid course that we offer here at Open Door Coaching and that's uh, designed and uh, licensed from Mental Health First Aid Australia. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as we go through the course, but the stats and facts that I'm showing to you today come from that program. So um, yes, I'd like to just acknowledge that as well. Hello, Lynn from Bellingham, WA, USA. Amazing. All right, so before we go on, uh, I just want to give you a little uh, content warning here. We are going to be speaking about mental health issues today, uh, and some people can find that content confronting or it could cause some distress. And I want you to know that this is perfectly normal, it's absolutely okay, and we're here to help you. So if you do find that this is the case, please send me a little message in the chat box. You can use just all panelists or choose just to send it through to me and just say, hey, I need a little bit of help. And uh, I will absolutely provide that for you as best I can. So it doesn't happen uh, very often, but I'd rather tell people about this than not acknowledge it. You know, acknowledgement is, is really key when it comes to mental health. So, you know, we're going to be talking about some pretty, um, pretty overwhelming 
facts and stats and things like that. You know, these are facts that facts that um, yeah, they do hit home. So if this is if this is happening for you, I just want you to know that it is normal and it's okay, and we'll help you as best we can. Now, what I, what we're going to cover today. And what we're not going to cover today is an important distinction to make. And the first thing to say is that what we're doing today is, that, is opening an opportunity for us to talk about mental health in coaching and mental health more generally. So it's, it's an opening, it's a starting point for an opening for a conversation about mental health. I want you to leave today having learnt some useful information, but also to have um, provoked some thought for you about how you might adjust your, your approach in your coaching or even in your um, general leadership role or your work role or your personal life, whatever it might be. But we're not going to be learning mental health first aid today. Mental health first aid is a particular course and a particular qualification and uh, we couldn't possibly do that justice in today's session. It's not what today's session is about. I do have some information for you towards the end of the session about the mental health first aid course, including a bit of an offer that we have for Coach Week as well um, for you to undertake that program. Um, and that's pretty exciting. So I wanna share that with you later. But what we're gonna to do today is look at mental health broadly, generally, and uh, start having a bit of a think about it. Um, but we're not learning mental health first aid today. Hello to everyone who's just joining us. It's great to have you here. So let's start by looking at some facts. Here in Australia, one in five Australian adults experience a mental illness every year. So in every 12 month period, one in five Australian adults will experience a mental illness. Um, and that could be something quite mild or it could be something quite um, extreme, you know, but one in five every year. And to give you a bit of reference, this means 16 to 85 year olds. So it's quite a broad category of people, um, but 20%, you know, one in five is 20%. You know, so if you're working with 100 people, it's 20 of them. If you're working with 10 people, it's two of them. If you know 20 people, it's four of them. So this is Australian stats. Now, I had a little bit of a look at the New Zealand stats because we did a session yesterday uh, for Australia and New Zealand, and it's very similar. And in fact, across the globe, this statistic is fairly accurate. It's not wildly different uh, as we travel and look at the stats around the globe. So, you know, there's a few issues with that in terms of recency of, of study and breadth of study and things like that. But what I want you to do is just kind of take the meaning behind this data. I don't want to get you to get too stuck on the numbers. I want you to get stuck on what you're going to do as a result of being aware of these things. So, and I'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, but here in Australia, 65% of people receive no professional help for their mental illness whatsoever. None. Um, they might go and get some, they might go and do some reading, they might go and check out some websites, that sort of thing. They might ask a mate. But in terms of professional help, 65% of them received no help. And this is a problem for a range of reasons, not least of which is because we know that if someone gets professional help, there are very effective treatments available for all mental illnesses that actually do make a big difference to people's lives. So this is a bit of a problem. Um, on top of that, we know that mental illness that goes untreated often escalates and, in, and then the impact on people's lives is, is escalated as well. So getting in early is really important and getting people to professional assistance is also very important. So we'll dig into the stats a bit more um, a bit later. But I want, to, I want to give you a bit of a definition about what is mental health. And I want you to think about mental health as a continuum with good mental health at one end and poor mental health at the other. All right. And if I ask you to plot yourself on this continuum, you know, where are you right now? Everyone in this, in this uh, webinar would have a different point. You know, they'd all be at a slightly different point. And that's okay. That's totally fine. And it's also true that we go up and down this continuum as our lives change. And that can be over months. It can be over weeks. It can be from one minute to the next minute. Um, it can be over the course of a day. We all move up and down this continuum, right? It's very normal to have shifts up and down the continuum, all right? And that's based on a range of factors. You know, there's a very broad range of factors about what affects our mental health and where we're at on this continuum. But things like you know, what we've gone through in our life, uh, how well connected we are to services, how much uh, we've developed our coping strategies, our coping skills, our bodily makeup, our biology. You know, are we 
um, looking after ourselves, are we exercising, what's our brain chemistry doing? So there's a range of things that, that will affect where we are on this continuum from time to time. But what I want you to know and take away from this is that it is a continuum and we're not fixed on this continuum. We move up and down. Yeah, we move up and down. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, a few nights ago, one of my mum's best friends passed away. And, you know, my mum's sad about that. She's, she's sad. She's, you know, having a, 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 she's a bit depressed, you know, she's upset, she's grieving. And so if I was to plot her on this continuum, I'd say it's maybe poor to fair, you know. But before that event, she was probably good, excellent. Right, so we move up and down the continuum based on life experiences, things that happen to us, and we, I think we can all agree that this is very normal. Yeah, and let me know in the chat box if you can agree with that, or if you can um, empathise with that, or you can recognise that you have moved up and down the continuum. I know I certainly do. Um, it's certainly true. You know, even looking at a small example before the webinar, I'm a bit anxious. You know, I want to do a great job. Um, I want to do well. You know, I want to do it, do it a great job. I want to be helpful to you. So I'm a bit anxious about it. But now I'm into it. I'm kind of relaxed. You know, I put my music on and I kind of relax. So you know, I moved up and down this continuum even in the space of 20 minutes. That's very normal. Now, the risk factors that are present for you know, increasing someone's risk of developing a mental illness are threefold. There's three of them. It's biological, psychological, and social factors. Now, biological factors are things like our, you know, our physical being, our physical body. You know, do we exercise enough? What's our brain chemistry doing? You know, hereditary illnesses also come to play here in biological. There's a real range of them, but anything to do with our body, our bodies and our brains, basically. Psychological factors, things like our coping strategies, you know, our coping skills, how resilient we are, um, that sort of stuff, you know, that those sorts of things. How much um, learning have we done to cope with stress? Those sorts of things. And then social factors are uh, things like our, um, our housing. Do we have stable housing? What socioeconomic kind of band are we in? Uh, do, we, do we live in a regional area, a rural area or a city? Um, what's our gender? What's our sexuality? All sorts of different social factors, you know, what our ethnic background might be. Those sorts of things all play a role in determining our risk for developing a mental illness. Um, Vanessa's got a question here. She says, I'm curious, do you consider depression to be a mental illness or is this, or is this another category? I'm going to answer that question on the next slide. So risk factors really, you know, they affect us, absolutely. And everyone's risk factors are very unique. You know, everyone's different. But when we look at an individual and then we overlay that with these three sets of risk factors, very unique, very, very unique. Yeah. So the question is... If that's the case, if we, if we move up and down the continuum and there's all these different risk factors and it's okay to have poor mental health from time to time, when do I need to be worried? When do I need to be concerned? And here's the general gist of it. What you're looking for is a major change in the way that someone thinks, feels or behaves. Yeah? So if there's a major change in the way that someone's thinking, feeling or behaving, you know, a deviation from their normal pattern. Then you want to look at if these changes that are happening affect the person's ability to function, whether that's work life, social life, home life, etc. So if this change that's occurring away from the normal person's normal way of thinking is affecting parts of their life, then we've got a bit of a cause for concern. And the third part of it is how long these changes um, exist for. If these changes don't go away quickly or if they last longer than expected. So I'll use my mum as an example again, right? So at the moment, her, her friend has just passed. So I can expect that she will be um, affected by that. She will be probably in a low mood about that for a good few days. This is very normal. We would expect this to be the case, you know? Um, but if that change didn't, go away in a week time, maybe two weeks time, um, whilst you know the, the, the thing that we kind of look at, which is her, her friend passing, is, uh, you know, is kind of in the history a little bit, we might start to think, okay, yeah, there's a bit of a change in behaviour, it's happening for a long time and it's affecting her ability to function. That's when I start to think, okay, 
maybe there's some mental health stuff here. So to answer Vanessa's question about, I'm curious, do you consider depression to be a mental illness or is this another category? It would depend, right? So if someone's um, a bit depressed, like my mum this week is a bit depressed because her friends passed away. I don't consider her to have a mental illness, right? What I consider is that she's having a mental health issue, right? She's having a broader mental health issue. She's feeling a bit depressed. Yeah, it's having an effect, but it's not an illness. If that lasts for two weeks, a month, two months, three months, then it's kind of getting into the stage where I would like to work out if it is a mental illness and get some assistance for that or not. But importantly, recognising that I'm not qualified to decide. Yeah. As a mental health first aider, I'm not qualified to make a diagnosis. Um, what I am qualified to do is to see what's going on and help someone get assistance so that that somebody can make that decision. Yeah. So I, to answer your question really clearly, Vanessa, uh, yes, depression is a mental illness, but we have to be clear about what's going on for that particular person. Ian says the social side is interesting because it also clouds our view of how others in different social, social situations are coping with COVID. Yeah, absolutely. COVID is a very unique thing. I hate using the word um, uh, unprecedented, but in many ways it is. Uh, COVID is another layer or another lens. Yeah? So there are lots of people who are quite um, anxious at the moment. And COVID has made people anxious, right? So... You know, and that anxiety might go on for a while. You know, that might go on for a while. But COVID's still here and it's still been here for a while and it's probably still going to be here for a while. So is that person who's still anxious about COVID um, uh, suffering from mental illness, an anxiety condition? I'm not sure. Potentially, maybe. I'd probably still want to have a conversation with them to check and offer to link them to support or show them what's available so that a professional can make that decision. Yeah, it's a good point. So when to be concerned, major changes in the way someone behaves, if the changes affect their ability to function, and if these changes don't go away quickly enough. Now, the first point here, major change in person's normal way of thinking, feeling, or behaving. What, this is one of the main reasons why I believe that we as coaches are perfectly positioned to see some sort of change in somebody and take action, particularly around a developing mental illness, because in coaching being so high rapport and such a relationship driven thing, I believe we get to see a side of our coachees that maybe isn't shown to everybody. If we've got great, um, if we've got great, you know, rapport with somebody and we can see this change, we're in a great position to, um, yeah, great position to help them. Sam says, uh, the best way I heard the COVID situation described is that we're in the same storm, but different boats. Therefore the way it affects our mental health will be different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just as it's the same as, you know, when there's no COVID, everyone's mental health is very different. All right. So let's have some stats here. Now I can see people on the line that have done the mental health first aid course before. So you should know the answers. Um, first of all, who do we think suffers the, sorry, not suffers, who um, do we think men or women have a higher percentage of mental illness every year? Is it men or is it women who have higher rates of mental illness? Let me know in the chat box. All right. So we've got men, men, women, men, men, men. All right. So mostly people are saying men. Okay. Yeah, cool. Let's have a look. So here are the stats for men. Anxiety disorders sit at just under 11%. Depressive and bipolar disorders, 5.3%. Uh, and substance use at 7%. Okay. Now, it's actually women, it's actually females who experience the higher rates of mental illness in Australia, and by some degree. So for anxiety disorders, it's almost double, you know, 11 to 18%. You know, it's close to double. Uh, for depressive disorders, it's not as uh, significant a difference. It's 5.3 versus 7.1%. And substance use is 3.3%. So you can see here, um, women experience higher anxiety and depression and men suffer the higher level of substance use disorders. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, this is interesting. So it's flipped around for substance use. Yeah. Um, 
Now the totals, as you can see here, anxiety is the biggest mental illness in Australia at 14.4% and depression is 6.2%, substance use sits at 5.1%. Uh, when we were looking at the New Zealand stats yesterday, they were very similar. Yeah, they were very similar. Um, Let's have a look. So less, uh, Rowena says less men talk about it, so maybe not represented in the stats. Actually, um, actually, Rowena, these stats were designed in such a way that they're a little bit old now, but they are the most recent stats we have. If you'd like to write a letter to the ABS and ask them to redo this study, please do. Um, it'd be very useful. I, I still think they're, they're very accurate. But what this was, was a home-based survey. So it was a phone-based survey, and people were asked about uh, their mental health and are asked about symptoms and signs that they're experiencing and to be in one of these let's say 10.8 percent the marker was if this person went to a GP and and said these symptoms they'd likely be flagged as having or diagnosed as having this illness so this is not just the percentage of people who've gone to get treatment this is actually a percentage of the population generally so it's not about, um, yeah, they don't talk about it so they don't get treatment. Ten, of these 10.8% of men, you know, 8% may not have got treatment and 2% did. doesn't really matter. It's just saying these 10.8% these have this mental illness by the listing out of their, their symptoms and signs, yeah. Um, and this often comes up that men don't talk about it, women do, you know, so, and that's the reason these stats are higher. It's actually not, you know, because this is not looking at who went and got helped. This is just who's experiencing those signs or symptoms. Suicide rates are a slightly different stat. We're not going to talk about suicide today, um, but they're a slightly different statistic. Uh, and they're not really represented in these numbers because somebody can die by suicide uh, because they're anxious and they don't have a depressive disorder, for example. So, you know, suicide sort of sits alongside all of these. Yeah. Um, just having a look at the, the stats. Yeah, so Sam says, as Vanessa mentioned, is this a willingness to gain assistance and therefore be accurately represented? In these stats, no, but for the reasons I explained, um, Fiona says, I think COVID has highlighted our lack of social connection in a very unique way and has shone a light on how disconnected we've become because we have, are not able physically connect prior to quarantine. Yeah, that's a good point. So the totals, let's have a look here. 17.6% in total for men, 22.3 for females, and that gives you the average of one in five, that 20. Now, these numbers, some of you will have noticed already, um, these numbers here don't add up to 17.6 much higher and that's because often people have more than one diagnosis so they might have anxiety and depression so this stat's going to be a bit lower than these averages or this um, the sum of these numbers so any surprises there I mean most people said men obviously of course there was that kind of surprise um, I guess the other one that kind of comes out here is the difference in substance use men uh, have substance use disorders at a much higher rate more than double than females you know Again, what do we do with this information? You know, how, we, how do we make it useful and practical? If you're working in a largely female team, then just be aware that on average, you know, perhaps in, in, the, in the groups that you work with or the, the teams that you work with, there's a higher likelihood, at least slightly, but worth thinking. But also you can't really say, oh, you know, I work with mostly guys, so we're under the average, it's totally fine. Because it's an average, right? You might work with 100 people and they all might have a mental illness. So, you know, just bear that in mind. Um, but I want to show you the real stats. These are absolutely real stats. Uh, on top of this, 0.5%, so half a percentage of people in Australia have a psychotic disorder in any one year. And usually when we ask this question about, you know, what percentage of people do you think experience a psychosis or a psychotic disorder, people generally say, oh, it's much higher. They'll say 5, 10, 12%. It's very small. Very small, 0.5%. Not insignificant, but small. Now, I want to show you this slide as well because it helps you. Um, it helps you sort of dig down into the industry. So, you know, you've got the ANZIC industries down the left-hand side. So, for example, if we pick out retail just at random, retail any mental condition is 26.7%. So, retail a higher likelihood 
for somebody in retail in that industry to experience a mental illness. Um, whereas you look at say, um, you know, mining 22.7, it's a bit higher, but these are the big ones, IT and telecommunications, finance, that's 33%. Um, yeah, these are, these are kind of um, big differences across the average. So again, not to dig and dwell on the detail, but just to give you a sense of how the industry that you might be working in actually stacks up against the average, yeah? Uh, Hermani says, uh, what is a psychotic disorder? So uh, it's not really something we'll cover today, Hermani, but to, um, to give you a bit of an overview, a psychosis can be a feature of any mental illness, um, but there are, there are mental illnesses that, that are, have more psychosis present. Yeah, it's a bit beyond um, the scope of today's webinar, but certainly covered in the full uh, mental health first aid program, yeah. Um, questions here, was the psychotic disorder stat from the same survey? Yes, it was, Katie. Um, Samantha says, whereabouts do first responders and defence fall in? Um, good question. I think first responders like ambulance would sit under healthcare and social, probably. Uh, I don't know exactly, I'm just kind of guessing for you. Um, and then I think in terms of defence, it might come down to exactly what they do in defence. So, you know, if they're in... Um, if they're in finance and defence, they might sit here. You know, they might sit across a couple. You'd have to go back to the ANZIC codes and, and get a bit of a, a definition. Vanessa says, the media sector is a surprise considering they're also spreading the news. Yeah, interesting. So where are we with media? Yeah, it's different, isn't it? 31.5, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's certainly interesting. I think, I think again, you know, let's just take in, in on board what this, uh, what this content shows us and just add it to our mindfulness about what's going on in our industry. You know, not to dwell so much, yeah, yeah. So have a look at the ANZIC codes. Again, I just want to show you how it breaks down more broadly because when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about one in five people, right? Those one in five people, you can split that data any way you like by ANZIC codes, nationality, ethnicity, gender, you know, all sorts of different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, what we need to come back to is how do we develop the skills to help anybody who's suffering from a mental illness or has a mental illness that's developing? So if we don't do anything about mental health, um, we don't really make a lot of business sense. So in businesses and Australian workplaces every year, $4.7 billion in absenteeism. This is simply people who take a sick day because of their mental health. 4.7 billion, that's billion with a B. 1.6 in billion in presenteeism. So lost productivity by someone who comes to work who isn't as productive. And 146 million in compensation claims. Yeah. So it's quite an impact. Yeah, quite an impact. Now, when we look at full-time workers, um, you know, 22% of full-time workers receive treatment for their mental health. And that means that 78% of people who work full-time receive no treatment. And this is much higher than the initial stat that we looked at, 65% of, of the one in five. 78% of workers receive no treatment. Um, so again, if we're working with people who work full-time, another way just to think about, yeah, these people are at higher risk. Yeah, and they receive no treatment for a range of reasons. But our job as mental health first aiders is to help them um, get that treatment for sure. All right. So here are some facts about how you know mental health problems can have an impact in the workplace. Here is a list of things that people often say: decreased productivity, decreased engagement, increased absenteeism, an inability to concentrate can't get along with other people effectively, has conflict, there's lots of errors, there's lots of accidents. Does this sound familiar to you? If you're a coach being asked to go and coach people, does this list sound familiar to you in any way? It sounds really familiar to me because I'll have people come to me and say, I want coaching for my team because I want to increase their productivity. I want to increase their engagement. I want to reduce absenteeism. Yeah, yeah, I want to do all that stuff. I want to get rid of conflict. So it's the opposite of this, yeah? So sometimes when we're coaching, we're actually coaching in a space where the thing that we're trying to coach might be coming from a, a mental health perspective. So again, 
coaches are very well positioned in my in my view to actually help with people's mental health yeah can anyone think of other ways that uh, mental health unaddressed mental health issues can have an impact in in the workplace i mean these are the the kind of common the common ones that are listed anyway it certainly sounds familiar to me like when i go and coach with organizations they say they want help with these sorts of things and i always think to myself hmm, the mental health let's keep that on the radar so early intervention is really important it's it's key you know to helping people with mental health issues that are developing it's very very important um, i said that earlier but i want to show you kind of why the main reason is that the earlier we can connect with some somebody to professional help the earlier they can receive treatment the more quickly they'll recover, the more effective that treatment will be, and the more effectively they'll be able to return to what they what they would refer to as a normal function. So if we get in early, the journey is a lot easier for people. So you can see here on this graph, you've got prevention, you know, someone's well, there's no issues. You've got someone becoming unwell, and then someone's actually just really unwell, and then they move through to um, recovery. So what we want to do is we want to get our mental health first aid skills and plonk them over the top of this graph and say, okay, well, when we see someone becoming unwell, we can intervene with a mental health first aid intervention and try and connect that person to support. And then instead of the graph going like this, we can sort of go, oh, it goes more like this. You know, it's a bit flatter. I don't want to say flatten the curve <laughs> because I've heard that so many times with COVID, but it is what we want to do. Yeah, it is what we want to do. So. Yeah, I'm not sure why my slides keep going backwards and forwards, sorry. So this is what we wanna do, early intervention, super key. Helen says coaches are in a position to normalize mental health issues and encourage referrals. 100% agree, agree with you, 100%. Yeah, and I guess with normalize, you know, the, the other way that I talk about that is I say destigmatize. Yeah, I wanna I want destigmatize because we know that stigma is one of the key drivers for people not receiving support or actively deciding not to get support. Thinking about it and then deciding not to because of stigma. So yes, we can, we can talk about mental health in a non-stigmatized, normal kind of way so people feel safe and they feel uh, okay to share and open up and then they might go off and get that referral. Yeah, really, really important. Good, good pick up there, Helen, I agree. So let's give you a definition about what mental health first aid is. Mental health first aid is simply the help that's provided to, to a person who's developing a mental health problem, experiencing a worsening of a mental health problem that already exists, or someone who's in a mental health crisis. The first aid is given until appropriate professional treatment is received or until the crisis resolves. So very simply, it's about providing that initial support to someone who you can see might be experiencing a, a, a mental health problem kind of develop. They might be having a mental health problem that, that's getting worse, uh, or they might be in an active mental health crisis. And we get first aid, uh, we, we get first aid happening for that person until appropriate professional support is received. Now, I want you to think about mental health first aid in exactly the same way as you think about physical first aid. Yeah. Now, when I, before I did my physical first aid course, I had no idea how to properly splint a broken arm. No idea. I would absolutely be able to see, oh, that arm's broken, but I wouldn't know what to do. You know, I wouldn't know what to do. Pretty obvious one. Yeah. So I learned, meant, I learned physical first aid and I'm equipped to do something. I'm equipped to assist instantly because I've learned it. It's the same with mental health. We don't, unless we know what to look for, we don't know what to look for. So we can't actually identify a problem and we can't therefore offer support. So, you know, if, if I, I was actually, to a true story, a few weeks ago, I was driving home from the office and I saw that someone had been knocked off their bicycle by a car onto the grass and a few of us stopped. The gentleman was fine. He was actually okay. He was only a light bump. He was a bit shaken up, but he was fine. Um, but we were all standing there going, right, well, let's have a look at what's going on. And we're asking him, how does he feel? What happened? You know, we're thinking, do we need to get extra support here? No, we don't. If we'd got there and it was quite a crisis, it was quite a big problem, we'd absolutely call out for support and we'd give support for that person until that support, until the ambulance arrived. You know, think about CPR, yeah? 
Now think about somebody who might be, you might look at, look at them and they're, they're breathing shallow, they're a bit sort of wet, a bit sort of wet and kind of sweaty and that sort of thing. And you look at them and you're like, I don't know if they're okay or not. I don't know what's going on, I'm not sure. Um, in that case, in mental health first aid, most people we know from statistics, most people don't do anything because they feel unsure, they don't know how to, they're worried about things, so they don't. So mental health first aid is exactly the same as physical first aid. We just have to learn it and then we can apply it. Hope this is making sense so far. Let me know in the chat box how you're traveling. Give me a little uh, thumbs up or all good or something like that. Let me know that you're still tuned in. Yeah, let me know in the chat box how you're traveling. Good stuff. Helen says, great, thank you. There's always a first person, that's awesome. Simone says, sweet as. Tanya says, good stuff, excellent, all good, good, cool. All right, great, awesome. Thanks everyone, thank you. Okay, now I wanna move into the next bit of the session and this is to have a look at some common mental health problems. All right, some common mental health problems. Um, and we're gonna dive into depression and anxiety. Now, one of the things I love about the Mental Health First Aid course is that it's designed by Mental Health First Aid Australia who have come up with guidelines about the right thing to do as a mental health first aider to help when someone is experiencing a mental illness. And they use what's called a Delphi method. The Delphi method is a consensus method. So what they do is they go out to people who live with the issue. So if we talk about depression, people with depression, they go to carers of people with depression and they go to the professional community. So doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, counsellors, et cetera, et cetera. And they say to them, what works? When somebody's experiencing depression, what works? What doesn't work? And the things that all three of those groups agree on become the standard. Yeah, they become the, um, the recommendation for what we do as a mental health first aider when we find someone or we, if we identify someone who's experiencing depression. What do we do? And it's so good that we know that it works based on consensus because, and I can tell you, I've had to use these skills, right? I've had to use these skills with two very, very good friends. And when I put this action plan in place, um, it worked, I mean, it worked, it was great. It was really positive, of course, for all the right reasons it was, it was positive, but I felt very relieved actually that it did work. Um, and those friends of mine told me, they said, what you did really helped me. So the whole course is designed like that. The whole course is practical, based on what works and based on facts. Now, with the, um, with the course, it, we talked about lived experience, there's artworks throughout the course, and this is one of them, done by people experiencing depression. So when you look at this artwork, tell me what you see. What do you notice in this picture? It's a quite a beautiful picture, I think. But what do you notice? What springs to mind? What, what sort of jumps out at you when you look at this, this beautiful image? Darkness, yeah, Tanya says darkness, yes. What else do you see? Closed body language, yeah, she's kind of closed in, caged, isolated, trapped. Yeah, the cage is indicating trapped, yeah, lonely. Yeah, in danger, sadness, symbols. There's the light of a lighthouse in the distance hiding. Yeah, eyes are closed, she's sad, brooding, yeah. Connie says, as a qualified art therapist, it's great to see artwork here. Yeah, I agree, Connie. I, I really like it. <laughs> I really like it. There's danger with the snake. Things are piling up with the rocks. Yeah, that's good. What I particularly love is every time I show this to people, there's something new. Um, yeah, great. People often talk as well. The one thing I haven't seen on the chat, you might have said it, I might have missed it, is um, the blue. You know, it's kind of blue. We talk about having the blues or feeling blue. This artwork has that kind of tone to it, yeah. And they talk, a lot of you have talked about the sun. You know, the sun's here, we can see the sun, but we're not really feeling the beautiful effects of the sun. We can see it there, but we're not experiencing that. So here's the description from the artist. It's that feeling or the non-feeling of deadness and unable to enjoy anything, unable to look forward to anything or to feel happiness. That is for this artist, depression. So I think a beautiful, um, a beautiful artwork that uh, they have shared with us and, and a really 
poignant sort of description about it. And for me, this description marries up with what I would expect, you know, to hear someone with depression saying, you know, that's how it feels. And it is how it feels. Yeah. Thank you, Hermani. Um, all right, so let's look at the sort of the, the, the facts about depression. Depression sits in a broader category of mental illnesses called mood disorders. And the medical term when someone goes to a GP or a psychologist and they're diagnosed with depression is major depressive disorder. Yep. So if you're diagnosed with depression as your mental illness, it's technically called major depressive disorder. Now, to kind of get that diagnosis, we want to see, uh, or we do see, a depression that lasts for two weeks. It has an effect on our emotions, you know, how we feel, how we think, our ability to do things, to work, to study, our relationships. And just so you know, in any one year, mood disorders affect around 6.2% of the Australian population, with more females than men. 50% of people who experience depression will have their first episode of depression by age 25. So if depression is affecting a large percentage of Australians, half of those people will have or will experience their first depressive episode before they're 25. It's quite young. It's quite young. Depression often co-occurs with anxiety and substance use disorders. And it could go either way. A depression can lead to a substance use disorder and a substance use disorder can lead to depression. Yeah. Now, I want to make the point about this 50% of people under 25. Think about uh, if this is a lifelong mental illness, right? If someone has depression for their life and it develops early in life and the gap between developing the illness and getting assistance is long, then we know that the recovery will be harder and less effective. And that effect thus lasts for a longer period because it's happening earlier in life. And we call this the burden of the disease. So another reason why early intervention is super important because we lower the, the risk, but we also lower the burden of disease over the lifetime. Yeah. And so we, with mental health, often we've got these kind of tragic kind of coincidences that, that it happens early. And so the impact on someone's life is a lot greater over that life because it happens early. So we don't want to shy away when we see these things. We want to take action and try and connect people through to support. So the symptoms of depression, um, these, are, these are some of the more common ones. A depressed mood that just doesn't go away. A lack of interest or a lack, or a lack of uh, pleasure in activities, particularly things that people were interested in before or liked before. Um, tiredness, thinking about death a lot or wishing that they were dead. Difficulty concentrating or making decisions. Sometimes in coaching, you know, if you ask someone, okay, so what are you going to do? What's your next step? And they just can't decide. You know, they just can't decide. That might be a sign of, of a, a mental illness, maybe. Yeah, maybe not, but maybe. Oops. Having sleeping difficulties, so sleeping too much, sleeping too little. And same with food, sometimes eating too much or eating too little. These are the main sort of um, symptoms. They're not an exhaustive list, all right, but they're the common ones. And it's super important. I know I said this before, but for depression, it is really important to get early intervention. When it, getting help early gets you a better result. Waiting gets you a worse outcome. And I want you also to know with depression that if you've had one episode, you're very much prone to further episodes. Some mental illnesses, you can have a single episode and that's the only time you'll ever, ever experience a mental illness in your entire life. Depression is not one of those, not at one average. You can have more than one. And once you've had one, you are more likely to experience another one. We want to get help quickly so we make sure that the treatment's very effective. Yeah. I won't harp on about that. We've gone on about that a little bit so far. All right, before we go to anxiety, are there any questions here about depression? Um, let's just have a look here. Vanessa, how is it differentiated from PMS symptoms? Um, Vanessa, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. I can certainly find out for you. Um, Faha says some symptoms are similar. 
yeah, and this is one of the this is one of the things with mental health, right? We don't know often. I mean, we're not qualified as mental health first aiders to work out if something is depression or not, or if something's anxiety or not, or if something's psychosis or not. Um, so what we want to do is if we're worried about that, we need a framework, we need a, a model to have a conversation with that person to check in with them so that they can connect with a professional who can make that decision or can make that diagnosis and who can give the right support. Hope that makes sense, yeah. Um, different differentiate from grief yes so you know grief is a process that we go through um, grief itself is not a mental illness um, but grief is a process that we go through and while we are grieving we can feel depressed you know so again there's layers at play often time with mental illness it's often about layers what else is going on sometimes we get we get a bit of a whiff of something's going on and we go oh this person feels depressed so we zoom in we zoom in and we find all the things that will tell us that yes, actually, yes, this person is depressed. But what I encourage people to do is instead of zooming in, is to zoom out and say, okay, so we zoom out a bit. How long has this been going on for? What are the impacts that it's having? So we expand our thinking a little bit about the, um, the issue at hand and we collect more information because a broader set of data is gonna help us uh, work out how much of a risk there is that this person does have a mental illness. So we zoom out. Yeah, we want to say what else is going on. Yeah, what else is happening? Um, how long has it been going on for? What are, you know? How's it affecting their life? Yeah, hope that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's have a look at anxiety. Same thing. Another beautiful artwork here um, from another artist. Uh, what do you see here? What do you see in this this artwork? People often talk about um, the choppiness of the water. Yeah, overwhelming. Yes, a sense of overwhelm. Hope, yes, there's eyes that are looking up to the sky. It's very busy. Yeah, disconnected. Chaotic is a word that often gets used. Yep, there it is, chaos. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, people often talk as well about this um, theatrical kind of curtain here. It's like we're looking in. It's like we're peering in at something and we're observing something happening, a bit disconnected. Yes, there's a spiral kind of thing here. Yeah, there's lots of images of females. There's males as well in here as well. Very grey. Yeah. People talk about the blimp a lot. Not quite sure what the blimp's about, but there's, it's there. So yes, a sense of sort of fracturedness, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a, a lot to take in. It's hard to focus on something. And here's the description uh, from the artist. It's a picture that takes a comical look at the state of anxiety and panic attacks and draws on the theatrics of silent film to do so. The sea threatens to swallow up the characters while the sea monsters are a projection of the fear that threatens to overtake the personality during a panic attack. So yeah, anxiety, it's quite a, um, quite a different thing to depression, but as we said before, they coexist quite often. Yeah, Gillian says curtain or stage suggests being observed and judged by others. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Pulled in different directions, says Karen. Yeah, nice one, well done guys. So what are anxiety disorders? The first thing I want to just say is that everyone experiences anxiety. It's built into us actually as a, as a safety mechanism. You've probably heard of the fight or flight response. You know, when something dangerous happens, we feel on edge. We might feel a little pulse of adrenaline and that's us getting a bit anxious, getting alert. Um, and that anxiety serves us well most of the time. Yeah. In a lot of cases, it serves us well. It keeps us safe. It puts us on alert. It, it's making us think differently to protect ourselves. Sometimes a little bit of anxiety can actually spur excellent performance too. You know, before the webinar, I was a little bit anxious. I want to do a good job. You know, I want to make sure that it goes well. You know, I want to do a great job. So that anxiety there is quite useful. It makes me go, right, it's 10 minutes to, I've got to get back to my computer. You know, it helps me. Um, if we think about the anxiety dial that's going from zero to 10, you know, if it's at a two, that's kind of okay. And then we can turn it down, back down to zero or one and that's all right. You know, at zero and one, it's kind of like butterflies in your stomach. You might have to have a difficult conversation with someone and you feel a bit like, Ugh, you know, I don't want to have that conversation. That's an anxiety feeling. But 
With anxiety disorders, what happens is the volume dial gets turned up to 10 and it stays there. You know, it just stays at 10 and it's always at 10. Um, and so I don't know about you, but I don't listen to my music at 10 all the time. Sometimes I do because I'm really into it. But usually, usually I'll, I do that for a little while and I turn it back down. And it's the same with anxiety. With an anxiety disorder, it's, it's at 10, 8, 9, 10 and it stays there regardless of whether or not there's something to be anxious about. So I hope that sort of gives you a bit of a sense of how we think about anxiety. It can vary, like we were saying just then, you know, it can vary from something feeling very mildly uneasy to a full-blown terrifying panic attack and everything in between. An anxiety disorder is more severe than this sort of general day-to-day -day anxiety. It's longer lasting and it interferes with things interferes with work or relationships. Tell me, what does anxiety feel like? You know, give me a list of, uh, of things that happen when someone's feeling anxious. What does it feel like? What does it look like? Nervous, uncertain. Yeah, thank you. Faha and Rowena, thank you. Nervous, uncertain. If you're looking at someone and they look anxious, what are you seeing? Yeah, heart rate, yeah, sweaty. Uh, suffocating, yeah, breathing might be laboured, an inability to focus, a weight in your chest, yeah, absolutely, fast pulse, yep, shallow breath, feeling edgy, churning stomach, beautiful, great list. Now, in the course, I usually get my group into two groups. I split them in the half and I say, hey, you guys over here, I want you to think about a list of um, signs and symptoms of anxiety, list them out on a big bit of butcher's paper. And then I take the other half of the group and I take them over here and I say, right, you guys, I want you to do the same thing, but for a heart attack, list the list, list a big list of symptoms and signs of a heart attack. And then what we do is we bring them back together and we compare those two lists. And it is uncanny how similar those lists are. And for this reason, when we're thinking somebody's having a panic attack or we, they're having a high anxiety, we should always keep in the back of our mind that it could be that or it could be a heart attack. And so, again, another reason why it's important to know in some detail what anxiety looks like and what a heart attack looks like so we can be empowered to, to kind of make the right, um, the right decisions or the right, um, take the right actions. Just on this, I had someone ask me a few sessions ago, you know, but if I call an ambulance and they get here and this person's just having anxiety, you know, what a waste of resources. Um, and I challenged that for a couple of reasons. One, I know because I've heard from ambulance drivers themselves say they'd much rather come and experience and, and find someone having an anxiety attack or having high anxiety than someone having a heart attack. They'd much prefer that and they're very happy with that outcome. Secondly, they're happy to come to any medical issue and a mental health issue is a medical issue. So, you know, why would we not get professional assistance from a medical, you know, a paramedic when we're experiencing a mental health problem, you know? So again, we're just challenging gently our views and our thoughts and our myths and our, our biases around mental illness versus physical illness. Any questions here about anxiety before we move on. I'm gonna show you some other symptoms here. So we, we got most of these um, cardiovascular, so that pounding heart, rapid heartbeat, often blushing, rapid or short breath, yeah. Um, neurological stuff, so headaches, sweating, dizzy, feeling like dizzy, you know, uneasy. Gastrointestinal, so choking, nauseous, yeah, feeling like you wanna vomit, vomit. Muscle aches and pains, restlessness, tremors, shaking, yeah. Now what I want you to do, just a very quick exercise, where you are, I want you to quickly just consider every muscle in your body. And when I tell you to, I want you to clench as hard as you can every single muscle in your body. Just tighten up as tight as you can go. All right, ready? Go, tighter, keep it clenched, keep them clenched. Keep going, keep it clenched. Who's shaking? I'm shaking. <laughs> um, now let go. Now, that little sense of relief you got at the end, you know, that little sense of relief where you go, oh, I let that go. A, people who experience high anxiety don't get that. And B, 
they experience that tense feeling most of their day. So anxiety can be something we don't see, but quite impacting. Now try to actually concentrate in a work meeting while you're doing that exercise. Now, quite hard. So again, just a little, um, little uh, kind of insight into the muscle side of things, the musculoskeletal symptoms of anxiety. Um, psychological uh, symptoms are quite unique for anxiety. So we're talking about unrealistic or excessive fear. So if I'm worried about something that it's not really something I need to, um, you, I don't really need to be worried about, you know, um, phobias, this can be a big thing. You know, if we think about phobias, you know, people who are phobic about going outside, um, if there's no direct reason why I can't go outside, then it's, it's unrealistic or it's an excessive fear. Yeah. Mind racing is a good one. It's sort of a very typical one. You know, our thoughts are just going a million miles an hour. Um, edginess, nervousness, vivid dreams, tiredness. In terms of behavioural, avoidance of situations is very common. So if I'm scared about if I'm if I'm scared of going outside or anxious about going outside, I just won't go outside and then I'm fine. Yeah. So I avoid a situation. Um, social anxiety is one that came up yesterday. You know, if I'm if I'm uh, anxious about social situations, I just won't put myself in them. Yeah. So this sort of uh, avoidance, and we'll talk about that in a bit bit more detail later. Simone says, what a great exercise to get some understanding. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> a nice one you can do with somebody as well really easily. So, in, you know, again, we've said anxiety for anxiety. It's important to get early intervention. It's the same for all of them. But here are the specific reasons why. Uh, anxiety and depression go hand in hand. If someone's feeling anxious for a long time, it's very easy for them to develop a secondary condition of depression. Alcohol and other drugs absolutely link in with anxiety. You know, if we're feeling anxious, you know, that whole Dutch courage thing, oh, I'm feeling a bit nervous about that meeting, so I'll, I'll have a drink, or you know, I'm a bit nervous about going out, so I'll have a couple of drinks and I'll be fine. And that can escalate. Suicide attempts are, are very common with anxiety as well, not just depression. Um, there's lower educational achievement associated with early onset anxiety, because if we can't concentrate in school, then it flows quite naturally and quite logically that we might have a lowered educational achievement. And there's some interesting statistics around early motherhood for young, um, for young women when they experience anxiety. Yeah. So these are the unique reasons why it's important to get early intervention for anxiety, but it is important to get early intervention for any of these uh, conditions. Okay, so I wanna show you the LG action plan and that's how you say it, LG. For all of you who've done the program, you'll, you'll have gotten this drilled into you. It's algae, not algae, like, you know, the scum on the top of a pond or something like that. It's algae. Now, who's a coach here? Let me know in the chat box. Are you a coach? Do you do coaching? Yep. Yep. Capital yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, great. Okay, coaches, oh, coming soon. Yep, good stuff. Oh, hi, bye, Mary. <laughs> Sorry, I just see all these names for you. I'm like, oh, hi. Um, okay, so for the coaches in the room, which is most of us from the looks of things, um, oh, Shirley's a coach and a mental health nurse. Beautiful. Now, this model, I'm going to show you this model, but I want you to know that just by learning it, you are not qualified to use it. Now, I say this really deliberately with coaching, with coaches who are looking at this model because in coaching, we love models. We love grow, we love we're deaf, we've got ears. We've got all these different models that we grab onto because they're simple to use and they make sense. Algae is simple to use, um, but it has some very specific do's and don'ts in certain, in certain steps. And you won't know those without doing the full qualification. So I'll point that out and I'll show you how that works in, in the setting. And I'll show you the trap for coaches too. So the A is very much about approaching the person, assessing what's going on and assisting with any crisis. So when we talk about crisis, uh, we're talking about the highest form of that mental illness, right? So if we're talking about anxiety, the highest anxiety in crisis is a, um, is a panic attack. Yep. And depression in crisis might be suicidal thoughts or suicidal attempts those sorts of things. So we're always going to assist with the crisis first and then we're going to click it back. Yeah, if there's no crisis, we're going to do the rest of it. But if there is, we deal with that first and then we go through the rest of the model. Um, 
Mike says, I'm so pleased you're reinforcing this message. Good, great, <laughs> good. I'm curious to know why you're so pleased, Mike. That's just my curious coach mind wanting to dig under the surface there a bit. So approach the person, you know, and you don't have to walk up to the person. You might just kind of be observing. And you, assessing just means what are you seeing that's getting your alert, that's getting your attention. The second step, and this is the trap for coaches, is listen and communicate non-judgmentally. Now, as coaches, we do this. We know how to do this. We're trained how to do this. Um, we do this very well. But what I want you to know in mental health first aid, depending on the mental illness we think is at play, there are always things that we do say and we don't say. There's ways that we do communicate and don't communicate. So I'll give you some examples, right? So with, uh, if we're dealing with somebody who's experiencing a suicidal thought, yeah, we always talk about it. We always talk about it. And if someone with a suicidal thought says, please don't tell anybody else, we always say to that person, no, no, we need to tell somebody else. You can choose who, but we need to tell somebody else, right? So, you know, that doesn't come naturally to coaches to say no to somebody, right? To say no. I hear what you're asking, but no, <laughs> not doing it. Um, you know, so we have to have to be careful. If we're dealing with somebody who's experiencing a psychosis, for example, um, and they're very close to us, a natural in, in uh, a natural instinct may be to put an arm around that person. Yeah, but for someone experiencing psychosis, the sense of touch can be very escalated. So that's not not what we do. So listen and communicate non-judgmentally sounds simple, and it is but you have to know what it means for each individual mental illness. Super important. Yeah, super important. Ian says, this is our obligation under the ICF ethical standards and most probably in our workplace. Yeah, I agree. And Heather Jane says, agree. You always remember the scope of our professional practice. Yeah, absolutely. And so, like I was saying before, you know, without being qualified in mental health first aid, you're not... Applying this action model is outside your scope. Yeah. Connie says, we always want to check whether someone is okay to be touched anyway. Yeah, of course we do. Absolutely. But sometimes when we're dealing with a really heightened situation, we don't stop to think, you know, it's an instinctive thing, but we have to be careful so that we can check it. Yeah. Because when, and this is what learning mental health first aid does. It goes, right. I'm out of coach mode. Now I'm mental health first aiding. This is what I'm doing. And when I'm doing that, I don't do this, I don't do that, and I do do this thing. So it's super important. Yeah, there's lots of these sort of nuances. Super important, yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna come back to your questions once I've gone through the model. The third bit is G, so give support and information. So this might be, if someone says to you, oh, you know, I think I might have depression, but I don't wanna go and talk to someone about it because, you know, oh, how embarrassing. You know, we might say, well, actually, depression is really common. You know, it's really normal to feel depressed, you know. The thing about depression is if it's going on for a while, then maybe you might wanna go and get some help. So simple information that's factual and that, that's relevant is, um, is very, very good. Um, give support and information is often under, um, under representing what we do, how important it is. The two E's are about encouraging the person to get support. The first one from professionals and the second from supports. Yeah, other supports. So from professionals, GPs, you know, go to the emergency room, paramedic, um, a psychiatrist, a mental health nurse, a social worker, whoever it might be. And then other support things like you might say, look, there's a great website, you know, Beyond Blue's got some factual information, or there might be a good meditation app that might be useful, whatever it might be. So these other sorts of supports. Um, I'm just going to flick back to your questions. Um, some clients, so Mike says, some clients assume that coaches have the competencies to deal with mental health issues. We don't without the appropriate accreditation. Absolutely, 100%. And I think this is another reason why it's so important to get this qual, to get this, this course under our belt, because if they do have that expectation, then we can meet it and we can absolutely help that person. Yeah. If they have an expectation that you're going to help, it sort of also says to me that they want you to. It's almost a consent thing there. So yeah, I agree. Getting the qual is great. And what would happen if somebody said, I need your help and you didn't know how? You know, you'd have to say, I can't help you. Or, I'm not sure. You know, so this just empowers you to, to have a model to do it. Faha says, be aware of body language. Yes, nonverbal signals, correct. Yeah, absolutely. 
Helen says, is it ever okay to touch or hug? Um, yeah, good question, Helen. Um, I can think of some situations with people very close to me where, um, you know, it, it might be part of our relationship that we do that. Um, in terms of is it okay to hug somebody experiencing mental illness, I might want to think about that a little bit differently. Yeah, for sure. You know, and like somebody else said there, you know, maybe asking is a good idea as well. Ian says, I think here we can all help as coaches. Yeah, agreed. And that GEE are areas we can support our coaches. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we can do this. And look, the course is um the course is really it's an amazing program, but it's not arduous either. So learning these skills, brilliant. Think about it, if you think about it like a physical first aid thing, you know, when my um when my uncle had a heart attack, gee, I was glad that I had learned how to deal with that. Yeah. 100% I was. <laughs> I felt equipped. I felt, you know, um, empowered. I felt confident and I could make a difference. Yeah, I could absolutely make a difference. Oh, that's very kind, Ian. Ian says it's a fabulous course and I recommend it to all coaches. Thank you, Ian. So we're all here to talk about mental health and coaching. Let's move our conversation now into our world as coaches. Yeah. I want you to think about it a little bit like this. Statistically, you are probably already interacting with a coachee, a client, a coworker, or a family member who's experiencing a mental health problem at the moment, or who's had one in the last 12 months, or who will have one in the last 12 months. It's probably already happening. And particularly some of you who are on the line working in large organizations, even more so. Think about it, 10 clients, it's two people. 20 clients, four people. You've got a family lunch happening at, at Christmas and you've got 20 people around the table, it's four of them. You go to a supermarket and there's 100 people, it's 20 of them. So, and the reason I throw in those different examples is because these stats apply across the population, not just to our coaching clients, not just to our workplaces, not just to our colleagues, but to everyone, yeah? It's the whole population. So this is where I want to have a discussion with you about mental health and coaching. But before I do, I wanted to go through some myths and misunderstandings. Let's go through them one by one. Myth, so you can say true or false, yeah? True or false, if I ask someone about their mental health, I might make it worse. Is that true or is that false? A couple of you are saying false. Yes, this one is false. We know from, from stats and, and from research, this is false. Asking someone about their mental health puts them at no greater risk. Yeah, no greater risk. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, if you, if you, if someone is experiencing, say, for example, a suicidal thought, this is where this one comes from a lot of the time. People have a myth that if I ask someone about, you know, suicide, that they'll go and and die by suicide. And it's not the case at all. I'm I'm telling you, hundred percent, it is not the case. As soon as we ask the question, their risk drops. Their risk drops hugely. So we always ask. It's totally safe to ask. We're never gonna harm someone by asking. What about this one? Avoiding something that makes me anxious is effective. True or false? Yeah, this is false. It might be effective in the short term, but it doesn't help us overcome the anxiety. Yeah, it reinforces it in fact, because it goes, yeah, I avoided that thing and I don't feel anxious. That works. But that's likely to have a bigger impact on someone's life. What about trauma? Is it best to debrief for trauma immediately after the event? True or false? Yeah, a bit slower to respond on this one. It's not uncommon. Um, so it's false, yeah? Um, we offer support immediately, like Connie suggests, absolutely. But we don't make someone, you know, debrief a trauma immediately afterwards. And the reason is simple. And it, it is that by describing the trauma and explaining the trauma, we re-traumatize somebody simply because they, they have the opportunity to relive it. So you know, we don't want to re-traumatize or actively traumatize people by asking them to debrief. And this is where organizations often get themselves in trouble because they ask someone to debrief quickly and that creates another um, another psychological injury, another trauma. So yeah, we'll talk more about this in the course. What about this one? People with mental illnesses are more violent than the general population. True or false? Yeah, this is false as well. 
This is false as well. In fact, the stats show that people with mental illnesses are far more likely to be the recipients of violence or the recipients of injury as a result of their mental health problem. Um, yeah, people with mental illnesses are no more violent than the general population. And the last one, what about this one? Someone with a mental health problem, is, oh, they just can't think straight. What do you think about that one? Someone with a mental health problem is unable to think straight. <laughs> Vanessa says, who does? I love that, Vanessa. <laughs> sometimes, Katie says. Yeah, it's a, it's generally it's false, yeah. It's a sometimes thing too. Because if someone's in the middle of a mental health crisis, they're probably not thinking straight, right? They're probably not thinking straight. Well, they're not thinking as logically as they possibly could, yeah? Um, but someone who's experiencing mental illness that's quite mild absolutely can have logical thought. Yeah. So Connie says, only when dysregulated in the moment and mind-body connection has been broken. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole range of things that are going to impact this one. But yes, good. You did well there, everyone. All right. Over to you now. This is a conversation. And feel free, if you want to um, come off mute, let me know and I can unmute you. But the question here is, can we coach someone who has a mental health problem? Let me know your thoughts, you know. And, you know, you can say yes or no, that, that's great. But I want you to think about it and tell me why. What are you thinking about? And this is something that you might want to reflect on your experience as well. I mean, you might have had people that have said to you, oh, I'm already seeing a psychologist in your coaching. Now, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk about that because, I, you know, I talk about that with my psych. Yeah. Um, or they might say, oh, you know, I'm a bit stressed, but I'm a bit prone to, you know, getting anxious. Or they might sort of say, I've, I have depression. I am anxious. I have bipolar disorder, whatever it might be. So the question is, can we coach someone with a mental health problem? Let's have a look here. So some of you are saying, yes, just be careful of boundaries. Yeah, boundaries are important, regardless of whether or not there's a mental health problem at play, right? Yeah, very much so. Um, Deb says, I think you can coach someone who has a mental illness, but I would want them to be, be getting professional help at the same time. Yeah. Now, this comes up quite often. Um, and Deb, I'm curious to see why you would want them to be getting professional help at the same time. And I want you to, to compare this situation with a physical, um, a physical issue. If one of your coaches came to you and said, you know, I'm undertaking, um, I'm undergoing chemotherapy for, for cancer, you know, but I'm at work and I'm, you know, doing all that. Would we say, well, I'm going to need a note from your oncologist, but I'm going to need to know that your oncologist says it's fine to coach. Would we do that? Not sure. Um, so I always compare our thinking to a physical health comparison. That helps me work out what, where my stance is often. Uh, it can be helpful. Yeah. Vanessa says, depending on the coach's training experience and comfort and depending on the person's mental illness level. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, unless we're qualified to make uh, mental health diagnoses or offer, you know, support and therapy type things, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not qualified to do it. So we shouldn't. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Ian says, people with mental health issues still have other, other issues to work on, goals, etc. Don't assume that they don't. Yeah, this is very true. So someone might have uh, depression. Yeah, they might be depressed. You know, they might say, well, I'm, you know, I have depression, but I still have goals I want to achieve and I'm still making progress towards it. So should we not coach that person? You know, again, it might depend on the severity. It might depend on the day. You know, sometimes you have a regular kind of coaching session and one day it's fine, but another day, no, my depression is, is really active today. I, I can't do it. So it might be from time to time. Yeah, it might be from time to time. Lynn says coaching can help manage life with a mental health problem. 100%. You know, if someone's experiencing a mental health problem and they're saying, look, it's, you know, my coaching question, my coaching goal is how do I, you know, manage my mental health at work? That's a pretty clear question to me. And I think it's something that I could, could help with. Yeah. So again, it's going to depend on the, the subtlety, what they mean, what's under the surface. But yeah, absolutely. Rowena says, yes, unless they're psychotic or in a crisis. Yeah, absolutely. If someone's having a psychotic episode or they're in a crisis, I'm not going to coach them. I'm slipping out of coaching mode and I'm doing something else. I'm doing mental health first aid or I'm doing physical first aid. Yeah, I'm not going to turn up to that person who's having a, 
um, a psychotic episode and say, so what are you trying to achieve today? Like, what would you like to do? I might ask some of those questions, but I'm not, it's not a coaching approach. I stop coaching. I start mental health first aiding. Yeah. Mike says, I've been coaching people with mental health issues. However, I never counsel them. Yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah, um, and unless you're a counsellor, you, you can't really, um, but that's a very good distinction. Excellent distinction, yeah. Fiona says, we've got a responsibility to understand the limits of the coaching engagement. Yes, I agree, yeah, I agree. Rachel says, well, I think in some instances it's good because coaching is future focused, not digging into the past. You can help move them forward through coaching. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that for sure. You know, I can, I can think of coaches that I've worked with who might be experiencing something and, and, you know, the bit that we're coaching about is the bit that they can, they have agency over and that might be a tiny bit of a big picture, but yeah, I can still coach them. Yeah. Deb says, people I've coached before, they've been really emotional and I don't feel that I'm the right person to guide them through some issues. I can coach them through topics that they're not highly emotional about. Yeah. Yeah, and this emotion might be a sign that this thing that they're dealing with does require a different type of intervention than coaching. Yeah, and maybe it's about sort of saying, well, for whatever that is, let's get you connected to someone who can really help you with that from a counselling perspective or a treatment perspective for a mental illness. And then for coaching, let's focus on something else or something that, that's not in that category. Yeah, or even go there and get a bit of a starting point and come back to me with your action list and let's coach on that. There's so many comments here, it's great. Vi uh, says, often it's a sign of trust that they let us know they have mental health issues so we can create a safe environment for their coaching sessions and their goals. I can't agree more with this by Mary because we know that people don't disclose mental illness because of a fear of stigmatized views very clear in the research. This is also why those 65% of people don't get help because of a stigma, right? Um, so I agree. If someone says to you, I'm experiencing this, I feel like it's a sign that they really trust you. Yeah, absolutely. And Ian, last comment here says, it's a given that if your coachee is not moving forward, mental health, mental health issues or not, you have to consider where the coaching is right just now. Yeah, I agree with that too. Good conversation. My simple answer to this question, can we coach someone with a mental health problem is yes, with an asterisk on the end, <laughs> which might make it not so simple, I suppose. But, but I, I'm, I'm starting with a yes, and I'm gonna look for the, for the point where I can't anymore. I'm not going to just say no, you know. Some people in this session, they say, well, if they're on medication, no, no. I won't coach them if they're on medication. And I say, well, you know, do you know if they're on any other medications? You know, do you know if they're diabetic and take insulin? Do you know if they take blood pressure medication? And does that make a difference? So again, it's just about sort of um, taking a bit of a stop and a look at our views. Are they stigmatized? Are they based on a myth? Are they based on a misunderstanding? Um, and challenging that gently. And I have to say, you know, if you're in this situation, you want to kind of nut that out together, you know, just kind of brainstorm it, give me a call and we'll do it. Because I want to make sure that people are supported the best way that we know how as coaches and mental health first aiders, and I will help you do it. Good discussion. So then why would we do mental health first aid? And I said before, I, I think for me, the reason is because we're in such high rapport client, with our clients, we get a chance to see things that other people may not see. And we have a, a very trusting relationship. So the likelihood is that people might feel confident to tell us something. And so it's about being equipped and feeling prepared and feeling confident to help that person when they do. Yeah, when they do. So I, I think it's really important. I think the other thing about mental health first aid is it shows us what works and what doesn't work. You know, what works, what doesn't work, what we should say, what we shouldn't say. And some of that's quite surprising. It's quite counterintuitive. And some of the people on the line who have done the course might share what they think about that. But it's certainly, um, yeah, you've got to learn it. You know, it's a particular skill that you have to learn. And to break it all down, you know, we can break down stigma and that makes people's lives who are experiencing mental illness a thousand times better. You know, to live in a world that's not stigmatised towards the condition you have is an amazing thing. Um, we can change people's lives, but we can also save a life, just like physical first aid can. We can absolutely save a life by knowing mental health first aid.
So I want to talk to you a little bit about the course. Um, this course is, is suitable for anybody really, any adult to undertake it. Um, it used to be a two day face to face program, but obviously with COVID-19, that's not something that we can do. So just launched this week was a fully online virtual program. Uh, it's a e-learning component followed by two facilitated webinars, much like this that we're doing today. So if you've enjoyed this session, it's very much like this, you know, and I present it. So if you like the way that I present, then you'll love that program. Um, and also, excitingly, just yesterday or the day before, we got approval from ICF Global to give 24 CCEU points for undertaking this course. So it's 20 in core competency and four in resource development. So if you've done CCEUs before, you'll know that core competency CCEUs are hard to get. Sorry, I clicked, um, clicked too fast. The course content covers a range of mental health problems and a range of crises. I'm not going to harp on these too much, but it's quite a broad uh, course. Again, very practical based on uh, you know, what works, consensus theory based on what works. So it's very, very practical. And I can assure you, you will walk out of those, those uh, sessions feeling very empowered to have a conversation with people in a way that you might feel now, but just even more so, uh, even more so. And, I was in that position. I did my course and literally three days later, um, I had a phone call from a friend and it was very clear that he was in a crisis and I helped him and I used the model and it worked beautifully. Like it really helped him, but you know what was also beautiful? It really helped me. Like it really helped me feel confident and empowered and like I could help. And that was really, really um, satisfying. So, We've got a few minutes here. Oh, we've we've um, wrapped up a little bit early. Stay on the line though. I want to have a conversation and I want to answer any questions, but I've got two other things I want to show you before we finish. Um, so let me hear your thoughts. Yeah, let me hear your thoughts about the session. Thank you, Mike. Mike says, what a great session. Thank you. <laughs> That's really nice. But what are you going to do differently now? What have you learnt today that you didn't know before? What are you going to start doing? What are you going to stop doing? You know, tell me a little bit about that. What's on your mind with mental health? Take your time, you know, I, I would like you to, or I'd invite you to use this little couple of minutes to, um, yeah, just to kind of think about it. Uh, Vanessa says, uh, would you please repeat the length of the course and in what time zone it's done or is it in your own time? Um, so Vanessa, um, just so you know, we can offer this course for people residing in Australia. I'm not sure where you're, where you're based, Vanessa. So we can only deliver this course to people to, uh, residing in Australia. Um, it is in the Australian Eastern Standard Time. So uh, we've got sessions in, in the morning, like a nine o'clock start and a one o'clock start. If you're overseas, then we uh, please send me a message, send me an email. I'm about to give you my email address. Send me an email because I can connect you with your local version of this course. This course is an Australian um, invention, if you like, and it's licensed around the world. So it's likely that you'll be able to get it somewhere else. Uh, Heather Jane says, every time I hear this material, I gain more confidence. Yeah, great. Excellent. Helen says, I've got a clearer idea of what the symptoms are. Good stuff. That's great. And then that says, as a nurse, mental health first aid is so useful in any area of healthcare as well as the general community. Yeah, I agree. Rachel says, thanks, you're welcome. Um, Vanessa, you're welcome too. Katie says, thanks for an interesting information session. I like the section on can we coach people with mental health issues? Has it helped, helped me see some different perspectives? I particularly like the comparing mental health to physical health. Yeah, that's really powerful actually, Katie. I find it really, really empowering, particularly to bust down that stigma stuff to people go, oh, you know, oh, yeah, well, this person's depressed and they're just down and they pull their socks up. It's like... Would you tell someone who's having a heart attack just to get over it? No, you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't. Grace says, yeah, there you go. I enjoy that comparison as well. Lynn says, helpful session. I've coached people with ADHD, psychophrenia, and mania. Yeah, excellent. Okay, now I did promise you two extra things. I want to show you this, um, this offer. This course is completely online, completely, completely virtual. Um, it's... Starting, we've got courses starting in the first week of 
June. So you would do e-learning before that. So you'd enrol in e-learning, then choose a set of two dates that you can um, that you can undertake. It's two hundred and twenty dollars. It's a very well priced program. This is a nationally standardised price. So every um, provider in the country will be delivering this course at that price. And excitingly, like I mentioned before, if you're a coach with a credential from the ICF, you will earn 24 CCEUs for undertaking this program for that $220 um, fee. Now, what we're doing is if you want to jump on the website and enroll by the end of next week, we're going to randomly draw someone to win the cost of their course back. Um, so we'd love you to take that. My number is there and my email address as well. Um, so definitely check it out. It's a great little course. And if you want to have a chat to me about it, give me a call next week probably, uh, and I'll walk you through it. Um, but thank you so much for sharing, uh, letting me share with you. I've got some resources I can send you if you're interested in getting those. There's my email address and my phone number there as well. And you can certainly connect with me on LinkedIn. Love to have a conversation with you about, um, about anything to do with mental health in your workplace or in your life. Uh, happy to, to do it. And I really do encourage you to, to have a think about that mental health first aid course. Um, even if it's not with me, then uh, certainly do it with somebody else. But it's a really great course for coaches. We've got some coaches on the line who've done the program and, um, you know, they've been commenting throughout that, that it's been really useful. And certainly wherever I deliver it, people say, wow, that was, that was really good. So, so thank you so much. Um, Vanessa says this, this house is very informative and affirming. I will look if there's a program in, in BC. If you have a lead, I'll appreciate it. Yeah, excellent, Vanessa. Send me an email and I'll try and connect you up. Um, Karen says, thanks for sharing, Nick. Thanks to Heather, Jane and team. You're welcome. A fantastic program. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Simone says, you can enjoy your drinks. Cheers from Hamilton. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Vi says, just fabulous, Nick. I'll definitely be enrolling. I believe it can make a difference to the lives of others and in doing so, my professional coaching skills and my personal growth. Well put, Vi, Vi Mary, thank you. Excellent facilitation. Thanks everybody for your very kind feedback. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up the recording here, but we'll stay on the line. Thanks everybody for joining me for our, one of our last sessions for International Coaching Week 2020, looking at mental health issues in coaching. My name is Nick McEwen Hall from Open Door Coaching. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you on a mental health first aid course sometime soon. Thanks. Bye for now.